Thank you, uh, Kristen Stam. That was a fantastic start. Um, ben, I want to thank you for joining us for the second time, even though this is only our first event. Um, thank you for having me back, uh, especially after that jacket. Exactly. <laughs> Um, ben joined us in our first uh, event in London uh, a year and a half ago, um, and which is this action photograph that you see on there. Um, and so um, uh, it's, it's great to have you back. So um, I don't know if you people have heard, there's a restaurant called Noma in Copenhagen um, that, that reopened this year after we taking did. some time off. Um, there was, I, I don't know if you're responsible for sucking up the entire travel budget of every major US publication or <laughs> not. But um, can you get us up to speed? We'll start with a softball. Get us up to speed yeah. with what Noma is right now, 2018. Uh, look, we're not that different to what we were February 2017 when we closed in, in our last location. Um, but we've moved and we've evolved. Um, you know, that was driven by you know, I think Renee was entering in the 14th year of, of Noma. And I think if, if he was here, in fact, I think he did talking to Ruff about it last year, you know, talked about that the team's creativity was only going up in increments. And that, you know, the idea to move was as much about the next 10 years. It was about shaking the system up um, and forcing them to think about creativity and craftsmanship uh, in, completely different, in completely different ways. And then layered on top of that had been these three pop-ups that we had done, or two at that point when we closed. We then did Mexico last year, which was then driven by his fear that we would move to another location and then just go back into doing what we had always done. Um, and so, you know, those, those pop-ups, those residencies are ultimately, you know, these extraordinary immersive research trips for us to learn from other cultures and other communities and become better at what we do. But we reopened uh, in February 2018. Um, we're closed at the moment. So, you know, previously Noma's menu, uh, which is a tasting menu, followed that traditional paradigm of 13 to 14 courses, starting with snacks, working up towards, you know, a main kind of, kind of primary dish, then something sweet, tea and coffee, and, and that was the end of it. And, and Renee wanted to completely change that paradigm as well. So now our, our year is divided into three distinct seasons, and each season has a distinct menu. So we opened uh, with winter, which is an, kind of an ocean-based seafood menu, where every course, every serving contains something from the ocean. Uh, we just completed our second season, which was summer, uh, which was a complete celebration of the plant kingdom. Uh, there was no meat, no seafood of any kind. And on the 9th of October, we will reopen for our third and final season of, of the year, um, which is our fall menu, kind of a game and, and kind of foraging based mm -hmm. menu. It's kind of like when, when Springsteen did a tour and would do one album from start to finish. And, yeah. and, and, uh, <laughs> but, well, but, but he also sprinkled some greatest hits in at the end of the set. Like, we're, we're, not, we're not sprinkling the greatest hits. I mean, we, we ne never, never want to, to set a low bar or, or a low challenge. So as I say, each, each, each season has a new menu. And then next year, those menus will not be repeated again. Uh -huh. So when we open our fall menu on the 9th of October, give or take a week or so, the team will then start, the R&D team, will then start developing the first seafood menu of 2019, and that will be a completely new menu all over again. Uh -huh. um, so we are in effect creating, or, or the team is in effect creating three new, completely original menus every year, um, which makes me tired just thinking about it. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. But so how does that, so you've had two seasons of that, and, and I know it's, you, you're, you're back, and so there's some, you know, everybody of course wants to book it, but. How does that make you think differently about reservations and getting people in, or is reservations not a concern anymore because it's going to be sold out anyway? Um, you know, the, the, the one thing that's changed, I think, between if we were to call it the old Noma and, and where we are today, was we now do prepayments. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything is prepaid in advance. And that's something that we started doing with the Australian pop up, was just the the dynamic of what, what it was that we were trying to do and the way that we were trying to do it meant that we needed that cash flow to fund those pop-ups, those residencies. You know, they're not small tasks for those that have, have ever followed what we do when we do those things. And so that's kind of carried on now. Um, but really, that's, the only, that's really been the only shift in, in the reservation model. So we open up, in fact, we did 
uh, the seafood menu last Tuesday. I think we reopened or reopened it. So we open reservations three times a year. Mm -hmm. um, we used to open reservations four times a year, kind of, you know, well, actually 12 times a year. We would open it three months ahead, one month at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're really just opening three times a year, three distinct seasons. Mm -hmm. Why, why does any restaurant or restaurant group need a, need a COO? One, kind of nomen specific and then also generally like, you know, is, is it a GM with a better title and better hours? Like, what does it mean to the core of your business and how you operate and think about? I, I don't, I, look, I don't know if every restaurant does. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fortunate that this one decided that they wanted that. Uh, and the role, the role has evolved for me uh, over, I'm coming up on three years with the team now. Um, when I joined, I was moving back from London to Australia and was leaving my career in television. Uh, for those who are looking at me now behind the scenes, not on camera. Um, I was leaving you look that. pretty good. Oh, thank you. Face for radio. Um, I was, um, so I was leaving that and, and Renee was thinking, you know, they were, they were about to open the pop-up in Tokyo and it was, let's do another one in Australia and let's just see what happens. And that's where it began. Um, and at the time, they had just, um, or Renee and, and some of the team had just decided to, to start a business with Rosio Sanchez, one of the former chefs. And that was really the, that was the business at that point in time. There was Noma, this restaurant of which there will only ever be one, uh, that had just about to, or had just started its first international pop-up, was dreaming of its second. And then we had uh, a partnership with a former chef opening a taqueria in, in a food market in Copenhagen. Um, and ever since that time, you know, I think our ambition to back our people has grown, um, which has just meant perhaps there is more of a need for some commercial rigor and some strategic thinking to kind of back or support, you know, that underpinning of creativity and craft, which has always been the, the and, will, and will always be the center of what we do. Um, I think when you and I spoke on the phone, if it was commercial and strategic first, AI wouldn't be here. Um, that's not what motivates me to be a part of Renee's team. Um, but we would look like a very different organization. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Rosio. Um, I'm sure you have, you know, talent just flooding through the kitchens all the time. How do you identify talent, uh, first of all, and then think about, okay, how do we help these people go and do something else? Because, you know, as you said, you know, there's only going to be one Noma, yep. um, uh, despite, um, you know, Vegas wants one, Miami wants one, Moscow wants one. Um, but identifying this talent, almost this organic way yeah. to spread Noma, uh, how do you pick that out of the kitchen and, or identify it even outside of the, the restaurant? Yeah, I mean, Renee would be the better person to talk about why certain people um, have succeeded in the Noma kitchen and, and why he has wanted to, as he'll often say, grow old with, with people and, and have these people around him. Um, it is a focus on, as I say, creativity. Uh, it is a focus on craft. But he will also say it's, it's that, that innate drive. And some people have it and some people don't. Um, all of the people that we've been fortunate enough to, to work with, whether it be Rosio, uh, Richard Hart, Thomas Friebel, you know, they tick all of those boxes. Um, they are, in our minds, the, the, you know, the most creative of their field, um, the hardest working of their field. Uh, and they, at the end of the day, they're good people. Mm -hmm. um, how do we? support them, it depends. It's, um, you know, n n it, there's, there's no one rule. Uh, there are some circumstances where we have provided capital, we have provided sweat equity. Um, some of them where, you know, the, the association to Renee and Noma is perhaps more overt than others. Um, and we'll take a position in those businesses that reflects that. And then there are others where you know, we, we're, we're getting into business with people who have um, access to potentially other sources of capital and we're taking a smaller role in the background. Um, you know, the underpinning in all of it is, is talent, it's people. Um, there's not one commercial or strategic rule or kind of matrix that we have to tick every box before we'll do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do fundamentally start with who are these people, what is their vision for their project, and they are their projects. How can we genuinely add value rather than just kind of clipping the ticket as it goes through? 
um, and how do we help them realize what is their what is their dream, their vision for their business? You, you mentioned when we talked the other day, you know, you wanted, um, I'll try to get the quote right, not the best restaurant in the world, but the best restaurant to work at. Yep. Um, that could sound like a platitude. Yep. Um, how do you actually make it something that's not? Um, how do you make it real? Yeah, I mean, you know, Noma, that, that's something that Renee will talk about, you know, daily within Noma. You know, that that's what motivates him now. And, and maybe that's partly because he has achieved some of those accolades of being that best restaurant and, you know, is not necessarily motivated by those things on a daily basis now. He's motivated to support the people that are around him, um, to create a positive change. How is that happening? I mean, we are, at a, at a business level, we are changing, you know, we are constantly changing and tweaking the way that we do business, whether it be doing a lunch and a dinner service or doing a dinner with a turn, um, whether we're doing five days a week or four days a week, you know, what he's trying to do is give his people a quality of life and an experience that perhaps he wasn't and some of the people of his generation weren't afforded. <laughs> Even the, the pop-ups, um, again, I think, you know, if they were driven purely by financial metrics, we would be doing them very differently. When we do them, every, we take, take everybody, everybody. Yeah. from the dishwasher to Renee, and all, everybody in between, plus their families. Uh -huh. and That's a terrible idea, right? It, <laughs> <laughs> which hat am I wearing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's an, you know, these are you know, immersive research experiences, but they are probably also the most expensive team building exercises in the world. Yeah. But what they've done is they've cre created a bond and a trust amongst the team that just drives people to be the best that they can be. And I think, you know, that creating that best working environment for, for himself and his team. You know, again, how, how can you say to somebody, well, I'm gonna leave my home for 12 weeks and I'm taking my wife and my children, but you can't. You need to leave your girlfriend or you need to leave your family behind. And then we're gonna outsource your job to somebody else who's- Correct, so, so how, how, how could we do that? How could we be genuine about what we say about who we wanna be as an organization and the way that we wanna support our people if we weren't prepared to, to be prepared to take everybody and their families with us. Uh -huh. um, you know, you mentioned um, uh, talking about Richard who's opening the bakery on- Sunday. Next, Sunday. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, the, the, the kind of work-life balance thing, Richard came to you guys and said, you know, I, I don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. and be a baker. Um, you know, that's, you know, one of the, you know, such a traditional a role for bakers to be sleep deprived. Yep. <laughs> um, how do you make a bakery work when you wake up at a decent hour? A little bit, a little bit of technology, but not too much. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so Richard, Richard had gotten to know Rene uh, over the years through his time with Tartine. He was the head baker at Tartine for, for five years. And I remember getting an email uh, from Rene maybe three years ago. I was still in Sydney. Uh, and the, the, it was a forward of a note that Richard had sent him, which was saying, look, I've decided I, I'm gonna leave Tartine. It's my opportunity to create something in my likeness. Uh, I don't wanna do it in the US. I've got four boys and I wanna raise them somewhere else. Um, and, you know, if there was an opportunity to talk to you guys about, you know, perhaps, you know, lending your support to, to what it is that I want to do, I'd love to have that conversation. And the email to, from Renee was just one line that said, I guess we're getting into the baking business. Um, and that was because his belief in Richard. Uh -huh. And you know, Richard is one of the most extraordinary people in the world. And I'd say that first above his skills as probably being one of the best bakers in the world. He's an amazing person. And he is a leader in the truest sense. And he wants his team, you know, not only does he not want to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning and go into a dark bakery to bake. He wants to be there to you know, send his kids off to school. And likewise, he, he can't look at his team and say, but I expect you to be there at two o'clock. So we are using some level of technology to ferment the bread and kind of you know, arrest it at the right point in time so they can turn up at seven o'clock. But whereas you know, many other commercial bakeries are now focusing on central bakeries or uh, commissaries, um, baking at kind of more of an industrial scale. Richard is baking by hand throughout the day. So that may mean that when you turn up at seven o'clock, what you're looking for won't be there, but it'll be there in 20 minutes time because they are baking everything by hand and throughout the day. And I think that's changing the expectations of the consumer. You know, we will focus on the consumer in, in the sense of, 
you know, Richard wants to deliver them the best quality bread and the best quality cakes. Mm -hmm. Um, but he wants to do it in a way that he thinks gives that customer the best quality, the best quality experience, but also having a happy team. And, you know, it is that perhaps cliche, but if you have a happy team, you will have the best product in the world. Um, this is, you're going into year two now with your partnership with Rosio or year three? Uh, it's actually coming into year three. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of think of her as your first experiment <laughs> Of doing this, what have you learned in the in the first couple of years with her two places or three places that are open? Uh, she has two takarias. Uh -huh. She has her restaurant, right. which opened in November last year, and we're in the process of looking at what the the next one might look mm -hmm. like. Um, she's extraordinary to work with. Um, again, one of the most creative, one of the most talented people that's kind of come through the ranks, and very clear on what it was that she wanted to do. And I think if we could bottle that combination of that clear, distinct vision of what it is that she wanted. You know, what she wanted to do was to cook the, the, the food of her heritage. You know, she was Chicago-born uh, to two Mexican immigrants. But to bring that authentic heritage of Mexico to Northern Europe, um, but to do it in her way with her take using, you know, local ingredients where the most authentic ingredients couldn't be, couldn't be sourced. If we could bottle up that kind of clear vision, that determination, that focus on quality, we would be you know, an amazing business. How has it changed how you think about doing an inv investments and this idea of Noma as an incubator and a, you know, developing talent? I, I, don't, I don't think it has changed. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that, that process started before I joined. Mm -hmm. you know, Rosie had opened her, her first taqueria before I joined the business. I just think they're getting much clearer on you know, identifying those people and that it really is those, those three areas. You know, having a clear sense of purpose is an amazing thing for a young chef to have. Having the talent to back it up, having the drive to back it up, you know, if you can combine those things, that's where you've got a really sweet combination and they're the people that we want to ultimately support and be in business with. Mm -hmm. um and is she opening a place in New York soon? Because I liked when she was at Shake Shack. <laughs> she's doing a pop-up here, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, she is. She's d it's sold out, so it doesn't count as a plug. Um, <laughs> she's part of the Seaport series in October. Okay. Um, so she is. Oh, but she's doing something here. Would she open something here? We are looking at international expansion with her. Um, where she wants to go is, you know, we will follow her about, you know, a locations that allow her to focus on Copenhagen. It is ultimately where her home is, um, but also the places that she wants to travel to. Mm -hmm. So you know, we'll, we'll, look at th we'll look at it through that lens before we look at through the lens of where is there a market opportunity. Right, uh, you know, but that tends to be kind of the backward way that a lot of places think about it. They're like, yep. we need a steakhouse here, so let's yes. do no mistake. Yep. Um, and not to keep pushing on this, but you know, they're the they're touchy feely elements which you've talked about too, yep. um, and you know how do you keep justifying kind of the touchy feely on the business side too? Because um, you've made it work, but a lot of we people have so gonna, far. Yeah, a, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to do that. Like no, they're not. I mean, I often you know. Talk and did it cause you to change your way of thinking about business operations? You mean too? me personally? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I've come from big corporate enterprises, you know, whether it be in the music industry or the television industry, which are focused on scale for scale's sake yeah. uh, and brand building and brand exploitation and all of those things which you know were amazing experiences to be a part of at the time um, but if I felt that we were veering into that direction I probably wouldn't hang around yeah. you know some may see it as touchy-feely some may see it as complete commercial madness uh -huh. in, in terms of the way that we focusing on the things that we focus on and being motivated by the things that we're motivated by but it makes a lot of sense. It make well, at least it makes a lot of sense to us. Um, you know, our view is that if you can back the right people, help them realise their dreams, and, and help them be as successful as as they want to be, then perhaps money will come from it. Mm -hmm. But you know, I often think about you know we were talking about, it and I couldn't remember the triple the idea of the triple bottom line. You know, companies like Lendlease have that. I wouldn't say we articulate it in perhaps such a formal or a corporate sense. But you know, financial results are one of the metrics that we measure the success of, of who we are. Um, 
the others are, you know, that, that impact on community, but also, you know, the, the people around us. And in, just as I say, ensuring those products are the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. Take a few questions from the, the, the crowd here. Um, the, any examples of front of the house talent development that you're proud of? We've got, I mean, I'll, again, I'll talk about Noma in, in, as, a, uh, as, as the example. I mean, we've had people, front of house teams like Lau Richter, who, who's actually just now um, left to become the general manager of Restaurant Bar, which is another restaurant that, that we're involved in. Um, uh, James Spreadbury, who you know, joined Noma, I think five or six years ago and recently became the restaurant manager there. Um, that front of house team has created, I mean, Renee will say, part of, or a very large part of Noma's success is its sense of hospitality, which is, I think, unique to, to, to who we are uh, and the way that we do our business. And that has been driven by people like Lau and by James, by Kat Bond, um, and, the, and the talent that they have brought in around them and, and kind of developed from, from the ground up. Um, we're very fortunate in that sense to have them. They've been a huge part of what we do. I mean, I'll often say to people, if you dine at Noma, you know, the taste of the dish that, that you had will be forgotten. Just that's given the, the DNA and the, the, the biology of, of who we are, but you'll forget the taste of, an, of, of a dish within a couple of days, if not a couple of weeks. A year or two later, you may remember a couple of the dishes, unless you've got Instagram with you, but you'll remember a couple of the dishes that you had. What you will never forget is that sense of hospitality at Noma. And that's driven by that, that front of house team. And also the, 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 the thing that, that, that model that Renee introduced a couple of years ago, which was kind of bringing chefs from being behind closed doors and being in the basement into being front and center. And those, those chefs bringing the food that they have created in the kitchen, bringing it to you and explaining it and creating that bond between the kitchen and the guest. Which is, I imagine, a challenge, just that you know, they're used to being in the kitchen and the interaction there and having to almost change hats <laughs> halfway through. Right? Yeah, but I think at the same time, it, it's a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something for a chef that has worked extremely hard either to create something or to be a part of, you know, developing it and producing it night after night, to be able to bring it to a guest, to explain it to them, uh, to see the experience of that guest as they taste it gives, I think, something back to the kitchen in the same way it gives to the guest as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, this first, the chef of Cezanne in San Francisco sued employees claiming they stole the restaurant's trade secrets. Uh, is that influence or theft? Uh, I can't really comment on what another chef has done or, or doesn't do with, with his employees. Um, the way that we view I guess the, the intellectual property of, of the restaurant, it is purely collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a team of 12 people in the R&D kitchen. There are 60 people in the kitchen in terms of chefs uh, at various levels, chefs and cooks, who have helped influence those dishes. We, we don't view it, we don't view it mm -hmm. in IP in the traditional sense, certainly not in the, in the way that I would have in my previous right. corporate life. Right. I mean, I heard a story last week um, about certain chefs who will withhold ingredients from their recipes for their cookbooks uh -huh. so that they can't actually be perfected at home. Right. And for us, that's complete madness. Yeah. You, know, what, what, you know, be confident in, in yourself. You know, know that you're creating more than just a recipe, you're creating an experience and share it. I mean, Richard's the perfect example of that. Richard wants people to come into the bakery. He wants to give them his sourdough starter. He wants to teach them how to be a better baker at home. If that means that they bake a little, they buy a little less bread, then so be it. But if it builds a connection with him and his team, then you know that's ultimately what it's about. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for being here today, Ben. Thank you Appreciate for having it. me again.